Umberto Eco, The Name of the Rose. First, I will read an obituary of Umberto Eco. Italian writer and philosopher, known for his medieval Who Done It? The Name of the Rose. Umberto Eco, who has died, aged 84, was a polymath of towering cleverness. His novels, which occasionally had the look and feel of encyclopedias, combined cultural influences ranging from T.S. Eliot to the Charlie Brown comic strips. Linguistically technical, they were at once impishly humorous and robustly intellectual. For relaxation, Echo played Renaissance airs on the recorder and read dictionaries. He was a master of several foreign languages. Echoes, E-C-O, Echoes' first watershed novel, The Name of the Rose, was published in 1980. An artful reworking of Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes transplants it to 14th century Italy. The book's baggage of arcane erudition was designed to flatter the average reader's intelligence. In some ways, as Echo was the first to admit, his medieval whodunit was upmarket Arthur Haley with ingenious modernist fripperies, subsequently translated into 30 languages. It sold more than 10 million copies worldwide and was made into a film starring Sean Connery as the monk detective William of Baskerville. Not since 100 years of solitude had there been such a consensual success in the book market. Joggers in Central Park listened to the name of the rose on their Walkmans. Echo's gifted English translator, William Weaver, built an extension onto his Tuscan home with the proceeds, which he called the Echo Chamber. Yet the success of the name of the rose weighed heavily on Echo. When the French director Jean-Jacques Anoud released his film of the novel in 1986, Echo refused to speak to the newspapers about it. Each night when he returned to his flat in Milan, he said he could barely open the door for the accumulation of interview requests. In private, Echo judged Anon's film a travesty of his novel and found the monks, apart from the one played by Connery, too grotesque-looking. Yet, Echo approved of Anon's Peter Anessi like sets, which he concurred were marvelous. In late 1986, when I visited Echo at Bologna University, where he taught as professor of semiotics, an obtruse branch of literary theory, he appeared unsettled and confessed that he felt trapped by his fame. Shuffling grumpily round his office, he lifted up and slammed down books. 
he was wearing a tweed deer stalker and a large digital wristwatch come calculator. Italian Vogue had just claimed that Echo was writing a novel based on the life of Mozart. Not true. I feel blackmailed by journalists, by myself, by my publisher. I don't feel free anymore. When I wrote The Name of the Rose, it was half for fun, a free act. Now I ask myself, am I writing a new book because I want to, or because it's expected of me? Echo was a polite, if oddly formal, interviewee. May I be permitted to offer you another whiskey? He preferred to call his English spoken with a discernible American accent, fluent pigeon. Bologna University had been a hotbed of Italian red activism, and the philosophy faculty, where Echo had his office, was often sprayed gunned, was often spray gunned with political slogans and crude attempts at action painting. Echo was not impressed by the artwork. The graffiti isn't as witty as it was in the 60s, he complained. Nevertheless, Bologna, or Bologna provided Echo with invaluable first-hand experience of political extremism and conspiracy. In Milan, Echo mingled with avant-garde writers, musicians, and painters, and developed a love for late James Joyce, as well as the atonal asperities of Karl Heinz Stockhausen and the hermetic symbolist verse and the hermetic symbolist verse of Stephanie. Malarme. The fierce inaccessibility of these modernist works seemed to excite Echo, and in the autumn of 1963, with some like minded experimentalists, he helped to set up Group 63, a cultural association which rejected conservatism in the arts and aimed to produce ultra-modern novels and poems of its own. Group 63's literary efforts now look slightly prolix and pedantic. But Echo, to his credit, understood early on that a fiction without a story was not worth its weight in paper. His novels would not have gone on to become bestsellers otherwise. In 1966, Echo was appointed professor of semiotics at Milan Polytechnic, and two years later, in 1968, he brought out the absent structure, which accompanied his earlier text, The Open Book. 1962, as a classic of the genre. His cultural writings began to appear in a variety of national publications. The Italian public came to know Echo through his witty weekly column, La Bustina de Minerva, for La Espresso magazine. Collections of the column were later published in English as Faith in Fakes, Travels in Hyperreality, 1986, and How to Travel with a Salmon and Other Essays, 1994. In these books, Echo's interests veered from pre-Raphaelite forgeries to counterfeit Louis Vuitton handbags from the World Cup to the U.S. porn star and vice presidential candidate Marilyn Chambers. This is what Echo did best, 
applying literary judgment to ephemera. In 1971, Echo became the first professor of semiotics at Bologna, or Bologna, Europe's oldest university. Bologna is the undisputed gastroerotic heart of Italy, and Echo relished the streets. Ah, and Echo relished the city's rich cuisine as well as its lewd medieval street names, Via Fregatette, Rub Tits Street, was one of his favorites. Portly, with a great black beard and husky voice, the result of 60 cigarettes a day, in later years reduced to the occasional cigar, he was a lifetime trencherman. His lectures at the university, avidly attended by semioticians, analyzed the James Bond novels, the mad comic magazines, and, with equal fizz bang, photographs of Marilyn Monroe. Throughout his Bologna professorship, Echo denied that he was intellectually slumming it by speaking of Donatello's David in the same breath as, say, plastic garden furniture. When the entire world is a web of signs, he said, everything cries out for exegesis. Marginal manifestations of culture should not be ignored, he explained. In the 19th century, Telemann was considered a far greater composer than Bach. By the same token, in 200 years, Picasso may be thought inferior to Coca-Cola commercials. And who knows, Echo added jokingly, one day we may consider the name of the rose inferior to the pot boilers of Harold Robbins. In his Mandarin analysis of the outwardly mundane, Echo was influenced by the French essayist and counterculture guru Roland Barthes. However, while Barthes wrote about washing powder, Greta Garbo's face, or the new model Citroen, or Citroen, in a subtle, teasingly paradoxical style, Echo's essays showed a certain crude braggadocio and swagger in Italy. He was not always considered a writer of very distinguished literary prose. I myself observed that his mind worked like a kitchen blender. In go a dash of Thomas Aquinas, a pinch of Burgess, some diced semiotics, and presto, out pours an interesting essay. Echo was at his best when composing bookish parodies and spoof sequels to famous novels. In one of these, the narrator of Marcel Proust's A la Recherche de Temps Perdus dies in Dublin after reading James Joyce's Ulysses and drinking too much Guinness. In one of these, the narrator of Marcel Proust's A la Recherche du Temps Perdu dies in Dublin after reading James Joyce's Ulysses and drinking too much Guinness. Italian university professors are expected to enter public debate, and Echo did not disappoint. Journalism, he announced with characteristic self-confidence, is my public Journalism, he announced, with characteristic self-confidence, is my political duty. 
Furthermore, I believe it is my job as a scholar and citizen to show people how we are surrounded by messages. In this, Echo was not so different from other campus media commentators, such as Susan Sontag and Marshall McLuhan. Like them, he could sometimes appear pseudo-cerebral. In one essay, Echo discussed the figure hugging comfort of his own denim Levi's. Well, with my new jeans, life was entirely exterior. I thought about the relationship between me and my pants, and the relationship between my pants and the society I live in. I had achieved epidermic self-awareness. Echo's fourth novel, Baldellino, which appeared in Italy in 2000, was set in Byzantine Constantinople. An enjoyable quest story, it was frighted with the author's by now familiar typographical eccentricities, footnotes, numerological games, and inventories. The book was a great success in Italy, though some critics enviously objected that Echo had sold out to fame. In the days before he became the emperor of international booksellerdom, he wrote a sneering critique of the 007 novels in which Ian Fleming emerged as a high-end Mickey Spillane, cynically devising entertainment for a reading public both popular and serious. Yet Baldellino, not unlike The Name of the Rose, appealed to a remarkably similar readership. Whatever his merits as a novelist, Echo was an exceptionally shrewd self-promoter. It is not often that an academic keeps company in the book charts with Jackie Collins and Dick Francis. When his next novel, The Mysterious Flame of Queen Luana, drawing on his youth in wartime Italy, was published in 2004, he declared it would be his last. Five is enough. The novel's title was taken from a fascist-era comic book, La Mysteriosa Fiamma della Regina Luana, which Echo had enjoyed as a pro-Mussolini child growing up in northwest Piedmont. He continued to read and enjoy strip cartoons, not least the superb Italian Diabolique series. On his retirement from Bologna, or Bologna University as professor emeritus in 2008, his literary output continued to be prolific, and included two further novels, The Prague Cemetery, 2010, in which characters voiced disturbing anti-Semitic diatribes, and Numero Zero, 2015, a razor-sharp thriller set in Milan in 1992, in which Echo explored the darker side of 20th century Italy, and the so-called strategy of tension, where Italian secret service chiefs allegedly connived with cabinet ministers to implicate the left in acts of terrorism and bring back fascism. The novel, its pacey and sparsely written pages, happily free of Echo's occasionally verbosity, topped the bestseller charts in Italy. Echo is survived by his wife, Renate Ni Ramja, who he married in 1962 and with whom he had a son, Stefano, and daughter, Carlotta. Umberto Echo, writer, born 5 January 1932, died 19 February. 
2016. This article was amended on 21 February 2016. The Abbott structure published in 1968 was not Echols' first study of semiotics. This has been corrected and the piece has been expanded. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.theguardian.com forward slash books forward slash 2016 forward slash February forward slash 20 forward slash Umberto dash echo dash obituary. Written by Ian Thompson. Saturday, 20 February 2016 at 0743 Eastern Standard Time.